Hello and welcome to English Literature with Susan. Today I want to talk about Nish Lawrence's poetry and specifically you would focus on his poem The English Are So Nice. It's a simple poem. Uh, by the way, Nish Lawrence is mostly known for his works of fiction, especially his novels or some famous short stories such as The Rocking Horse Winner. Uh, but but um, and, and he is also related to a Freudian way of analysis. Psychoanalytic readings of his works are available, especially in case of Sons and Lovers or Lady Chatterley's Love or uh, <clears throat> other works of fiction written by him. Uh, he, he had an acute sense of the representation of the psyche of human beings. He was uh, somehow familiar with the ideas of Sigmund Freud, especially the idea of the Oedipus complex, and he wanted to rely on them in many of his fictions. So, um, of course, uh, um, in, in place of Freud's uh, sexualism, author sexualism, D. H. Lawrence had his uh, fictional and artistic representations. By the way, let us <clears throat> focus on his poetry. So he's not mostly known for his poetry, but he's a very good poet. Um, he, he, he wasn't liked at his own time, but later on his poetry was praised by the critics. And um, we will see that um, at first D. H. Lawrence follow the traditions of poetry, but um, as time passed on, he tried to develop his own base of representation uh, of, uh, of let, let's say, for example, the metrical pattern was rejected by him and he relied on free verse for his poetry. Uh, Dish Lawrence, if you check uh, the Norton Anthology of English Literature, we can see some highlights about his poetry. Uh, we can read here this part. In his poetry and his fiction, Lawrence seeks to express the deep rooted, the elemental, the instinctual in people and nature. So uh, these are the, uh, the characteristics of his poetry. We can say he is at constant war with the mechanical and artificial, especially the artificial ways of living in England, the bourgeois class. He was against the values um, and the codes of the middle classes, and he rejected and criticized them both in his poetry and works of fiction. But his constraints and hypocrisies, the civilization imposes. Uh, so, so when when you're against civilization, one re, uh, one result is that you turn back to nature, and this is also happening in case of uh, Dish Lawrence because he had new things to say and new ways of saying them. He was not easily or quickly appreciated. So both um, we can say from the point of view of the themes and the subject matters introduced in his poetry and the forms um, he wrote his poetry in, he was not accepted or appreciated, as you can read here. Although his early novels are more conventional in style and treatment from the publication of The Rainbow, the critics turned away in bewilderment and, con and condemnation because in Rainbow, he highlighted and accentuated those psychological traits and colors. The rest of his life during which he produced about a dozen more novels and many poems, um, let's say that Dish Lawrence um, lived about 40 something uh, years, so he died very young of tuberculosis. Short stories, sketches, and miscellaneous articles was, in his words, a savage enough pilgrimage. So he, he looks at his art as a pilgrimage, as a quest marked by incessant struggle and by periods of frustration and despair. Uh, per, uh, phrases such as supreme impulse and quickening spontaneous emotion were characteristic of Lawrence's belief in intuition. So we can see words such as intuition, impulse, spontaneity. Um, these are the characteristics of his poetry uh, in the dark forces of the inner self. And the dark forces of the inner self refers back to that psychological analysis and aspect in his works that must not be allowed to be assumed by the rational faculties, but must be brought into a harmonious relation with them. So he doesn't deny or reject the inner self or those uh, forbidden parts or uh, taboo parts of human psyche. In poetry and fiction, Lawrence saw a new, uh, out new modes of expression. He began writing in traditional verse form, but especially after 1912, I have explained these that he changed his uh, method of representation. Uh, so the, 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 his poetry uh, called, uh, is called the insurgent naked, naked throb or pulse of the instant moment. He, in this way, we can say that he's 
a kind of romantic, both in its American and English version, harkening back to the experiments of the American poet Walter Whitman and anticipating the more open and organic forms of the later 20th century, Lawrence came poetry must be spontaneous, flexible, alive, direct utterance from the instant whole man and should express the pulse and pulsating carnal self. And he has written these things and has articled the poetry of the present. To convey the dynamism of animals and people, the emotional in intensity of human relationships, his poems repeat and develop symbols or layer ca uh, causes in ritualistic cadence or unfold parallels with ancient myth. Vehemently autobiographical, the vital and even ecstatic encounters with nature, sex, and raw feelings in his poems assert the primacy of the unconscious and instinctual self from which he felt uh, the cerebral intellectual self had alienated the English middle classes. So the, the English middle classes always appear uh, as a point of departure for him, and he, he has that critical eye towards them. And finally, um, in late 1950s, the critic A. Alvarez judged um, uh, D. H. Lawrence as the only native English poet of any importance to survive the First World War. Was, uh, there was D.H. Lawrence actually, according to him. And this is important. Maybe when we discuss uh, poetry of the first decades of the 20th century, we must the focus of the American poets, especially Pound Eliot and the Images Movement, or the poets of America, like, um, like Frost and Marion Moore sometimes. Although there are complex reasons for the posthumous critical triumph of his writer, who was so much revi reviled and hated in his lifetime, there's also a simple and striking reason that must not be forgotten. Lawrence had vision. He responded intensely to life. He had a keen ear and a piercing eye for vitality and color and sound for landscape, be it of England or Italy or New Mexico, because he was um, rejected from the poetic societies in England. Um, he was forced to migrate to other countries. He lived sometimes in New, New Mexico and um, he uh, um, just spent a part of his life in Italy for the individuality and concreteness of things in nature and for the individuality and concreteness of people. Uh, one concrete version, concrete image of the English people appears in his poem, The English Are So Nice. Uh, the poet, with a very ironical tone, criticizes um, the nicety of the English people. And of course, he's accepting it uh, on the surface, but deep down, he's rejecting the whole idea. And that's why I, I, I use the term irony. He's ironically saying something, meaning something else, criticizing the English people. The English are so nice, so awfully nice. They are the nicest people in the world. Uh, so awfully nice. So you, you see that they, there is some negativity here. And, and what's more, they are very nice about being nice, about your being nice as well. If you're not nice, they soon make you feel it. So here maybe um, he's talking about uh, the, the colonialism, that we can read this part of the poem from the post-colonial one of you that how the English uh, were trying to export their nicety to other nations, many nations in the um, placing in the rest of the world. And then uh, some other nations are named here, Americans and French and Germans and so on. They are all very well, but they are not really nice, you know. They are not nice in our sense of the word, are they now? And then um, he's kind of talking about the war and what had happened. <clears throat> some of them were the allies and some the opponents of England in the war, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> they are not English, therefore they are not nice. And here I ask you to notice uh, the language of the poem, how colloquial, everyday it seems, how it addresses the audience and how um, the assurance stands uh, away from the poetic, poetical conventions of the 19th century and earlier English poetry. In general. That's why one doesn't have to take them, the other nations, the English um, don't take uh, the French, the American, the German seriously because they are not nice enough. We must be nice to them, of course, of course, naturally, because naturally we're nice. And you see the, the irony, the sharp, even it's beyond irony, the sharp sarcasm in his language. 
but it doesn't really matter what you say to them they don't really understand you can't just say anything to them because they don't understand you because they don't listen to you uh maybe they are self-centered something they, 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 he's biting really his language is biting be nice you know dress nice but you must never take them seriously the other the other nations uh they wouldn't understand, sorry, they, they, they wouldn't understand, uh, which refer to, of course, the American, the French, and the Germans. Just be nice, you know. Oh, fairly nice, not too nice, of course. They take advantage. Be nice enough. Uh, do you see how, how he's talking about other nations and how the English view them? He's very brave, if you ask me. They're just nice enough to let them feel they are not quite as nice as it might be. And the poem, uh, the poem ends here. Uh, in this way, I thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the poem.